is going to be nope, our test. Nope, not at all. All right, we're already streaming. Okay. All right. Check, check, check. Good Please go ahead. Sounding good in the camera. Good in the camera. Sounding good in the camera. All right. Get loud for me. Okay. Getting loud. I am getting loud. It's right there. That it is. Look. All right. You're set. Handhelds. All right. Just on to test the handhelds now. Hello. Oh, you sound good. Go ahead. Talk to me. Tell me a story about when you were five. When I was five, the world was a much simpler place. That's what they say. Everything looked a lot bigger. <laughs> Works good. So we just got to test out the other mic. Go ahead, Edward. Alina? Oh, good. The microphone works. Hi. How are you today? How are the volumes up there? It's good. It sounds pretty loud in the room off of this microphone. Yeah, that's fine. We can actually lower it from the right. We can bring the gain down on this one. This yeah. is number two. Yep. Talking. Go ahead, talk into it. I think this one was pretty loud. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna and lower it down, down a little bit too. Right, but we may need to bring. Uh, Testing. One, two, one, two. So we're just working off of here. So mic number two. Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, one, two. Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, one, two. Okay, that's a lot better. Testing, one, two. 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 So yeah, it's going to be a two-part system. I'm going to do one yeah, live stream here, and he's going to be confirming the office. So I so think mean, Congress, I can just call him and watch it. Uh, How many doors do I have? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So why don't we go off of the steps? Yeah. It's right on the line. Okay. You don't see it. Yeah. It's going to see. All right. I'm going to just log into Max's account. So you're already in French. Okay. Okay. So Edward Powell. Like if there's a scene under here. Eric Gilmore. Sender, testing one two, testing one two. Let's grab the other mic. Testing. Okay, let's lower this one. This one's numero uno. Testing one two, testing one two. I have a question. I have a question, Eric. That haircut. That, that, that is my question. <laughs> Testing one two, testing one two, a little bit lower E. Testing one two, a little bit higher. Testing one two, test. Okay, that sounds good. Let me see how it's coming out of the camera. Testing one two, testing one two. Testing, 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 testing one two. All right, it's coming good in the camera. Testing one two, testing one two. Let me go bring up live stream in the office. Okay. Testing one two. Uh, we have a specific website where it's being displayed. Agree. I'm gonna forward it to your email. Uh, don't don't do that. Okay. My, my email's all crazy right now. So I'm this serious. isn't going straight to Adobe Live Stream. This is going to a sub website. It is uh, livestream.com backslash Kellogg Stream. Kellogg Stream. Okay. Three is written now. T H R E. Okay. And you both, I felt were the ones. What do I do?
So, definitely. And I mean, the other thing you can do to test that is actually question things that are not Testing one two, testing one two, testing one two, testing one two, testing one two. Mic check, testing one two. Within functions, yeah.
is actually that whole brown bag. Sorry about the LeBron. It's more brown. Oh, I love Shane. There's nothing to say. What he does on that team is he's a stretch four. That moves that moves LeBron. I mean, both Ray Allen and Mike Miller. Right. So the bag works. He just blinks it up. It's going on that high. Small. Yes, I did. I'm, I'm not stuck in, uh, you know, old school. Uh, I don't have any sign <laughs> Everybody got out of this row. This is not a good row. No, it is. It is for the people who come last. That's where they go. That's right. Tech support. I guess there's something at 250 that he wants to remove. He's not really sure what it is, and I couldn't understand what he was saying. Something about white doors? That's quite all right. Thank you. Oh, great.
Professors, and uh, for those of you that were at the show last night, uh, good morning, organizational behavior <laughs> professors. <laughs> so uh, this morning we're going to kick it off by talk, looking at and uh, exploring some ideas about knowledge and networks. Uh, we've got two very distinguished speakers for us today. In fact, we're very lucky to kick it off uh, with uh, one of the most uh, distinguished speakers in all of uh, computer science, Ha Wei Jia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good morning. So, uh, I'm a professor in UIUC, Urbana-Champaign. So I just uh, drove down here, actually, because it, yesterday morning I got some meeting. So really sorry I came here, it's almost 4 o'clock. So I missed most of the morning at the yesterday's session. But I got a very, I learned very exciting talk from Athens and also I heard lots of very exciting discussions. I think this is really great. Of course, in computer science, we get down into more uh, algorithms and technical details. Uh, so the, uh, for this slide, so I can try to omit all the technical details. But uh, if you want to ask me, definitely I can give you more on the technical discussions. So what we have been working on is on mining and exploring what we call semi-structured heterogeneous social information networks. Uh, actually, this project was supported by 
U.S. Army Research Lab, besides Natural Science Foundation and many other agencies. Uh, for network science, actually, Army Research Lab uh, invested lots of money. Uh, I'm leading on the Information Network uh, Academic Research Center, and the Bolek here is leading social, you know, uh, in the social network academic research center. So, so we have actually lots of uh, professors, including Professor Nash Contractor and Professor Brian Woosie, are all in this network science uh, adventure. Okay. Sandy, Sandy, yeah, Sandy, Sandy is over there. Yes, oh, sorry, Sandy. Uh, Professor Sandy Penden. So we got quite a few people here, you know, in this uh, network science. So it's uh, quite exciting. So what I'm going to discuss. Essentially, is our work at UIC uh, is working on mining heterogeneous information networks. So I'm going to discuss two major topics. One called how to mine the heterogeneous social and information networks. The second one is how to construct and enrich the networks. Because the real world data actually is not a nice network, or it's very noisy or it may not be always true. So we try to get a second task to build an infrastructure for this network mining. So uh, the first thing is everybody discussing about networks. But many people discussing networks say, uh, friends, people connecting with people, uh, web pages connected with web pages, the word connected together as a word net or something, right? But there's a, one major thing we probably can think about is, in the real world, after the connection, in many cases may or may not happen with people exactly connected with people, but people connected with other things, and then they connect together. Just give you an example, okay. Suppose I'm working on data mining. I wrote lots of articles on data mining. Uh, we have some other people, for example, Christos Falusus, or, uh, you know, Bakash Agar, they may or may not really co-author paper with me, but they have lots and lots of keywords or conference publications <coughs> in the same places or use similar things. So essentially, we are connected together. And from the research-wise, we connected together even very tight, although we do not have the real directly collaborated paper. So to that extent, we are thinking about is there are multiple objects or multiple kinds of objects. For example, you, you can see we have authors, we have papers, we have venues, or we have keywords. They all connect together to form a multi-type objects connection. We call this one as a multi-type heterogeneous networks. Then if you look at the real world, most of things are connecting that way. For example, you look at a movie. Okay, IMDB, you look at you know, uh, hundreds, thousands of different kinds of movies. You probably see there are movies, but they connect it to directors, to actors, to captions, to different studios. So that connection, to some extent, actually is very substantial rather than just the, say, actor connecting with actors. So the same thing, even you look at Facebook, you say people connected with people, but in many cases, you actually thinking, you want to say, for what they connect together. Maybe they are close friends, family members, or they may, may be you know, high school, you know, classmates, or they work together on certain topics. Those connections actually are very heterogeneous and very different. Yeah. So, and we are thinking about is, if you think just friends connected with friends, just look at the co-author relationships, okay? In many cases, you may miss a lot of information. Why we co-author? Maybe we work on, uh, maybe one part is connecting from the social science, the other connected with business school, the other connected with computer science. We connected together, we do collaboration, is multidisciplinary <coughs> collaboration. But if I connect with my students, we just work on some particular algorithms, that connection is different. Okay, but with papers, with keywords, with all these things, things become clear. So with this network, we call heterogeneous information network. What things can be mined? Actually, just give you a simple example. We took the real data sets, but it's very simple, very easy. You look at the top part, okay, 
The top part, this is just a one single entry. Okay. This is just a bunch of authors. Okay. They just uh, get a type of the paper, then get uh, the forum. It's, uh, Wisdom is web search in Daymind, this conference. 2012, that's a page number. So every entry looks like this. It looks very dark. It's not nothing else. But there are two minutes, over two minutes of them in computer science. And store in the same place in XML. Okay. But with this dumb entries, what things you can get? Okay. Actually, there are very exciting things you can mine from it if you think this one is a heterogeneous network. Just give you an example. Okay. For example, somebody may say, how the computer science research structure? That means how many fields, sub fields, every field, uh, which forums are the leading forum? Who are the leading researchers on a particular field, like web search? Okay. And who, for, for example, you, you look at the AI, you say, what are the major researchers? What are the key, uh, say, topics they're discussing? And which forums you really want to read? And you give a particular researcher, like Yuri Laskovic, is a young assistant professor in Stanford. You say, who is most similar to this guy? Okay. So you want to know this, instead of you go into the real web page, you just go to this DBRP, which is Computer Science Publication Network. You may get a very interesting answers. And a, a more interesting thing is Christos Palosos, who was uh, Yuri Laskovic's advisor okay. in one talk. We, uh, I gave a keynote in Europe, in Barcelona. He was sitting there, and he raised hands. He says, it seems your, ma your network is quite magic. Can you predict what papers I'm going to write next? <laughs> <laughs> OK. I, I actually brought this joke, because I myself do not know what paper I'm going to write next year, tell you the truth. Okay. But you know, the, the student actually took this. She actually said, of course, I cannot predict the concrete titles, but at least I can predict easily what kind of field it is, it is going to work on because of based on past history, right? It's really easy. She actually gave an even harder task to, to ourselves. Say, in the next several years, what are the new collaborators Crystal Palosos is going to co collaborate with? Okay. And of course, we cannot find new students because we even do not know them. We just look at the existing authors, say whether we can predict. Actually, it happens the prediction was quite accurate. Okay. So you can see the network is quite magic. And uh, for example, you look at the evolution of the fears, or uh, you know, finding outliers, or know who will be the outliers, or were the outliers in certain fields. Actually, it's not that hard if you think about you know, all, almost all the applications. Okay. So we take this as an example. We work out a few very interesting algorithms. Okay. Probably just give you the, 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 the functionality we can get from this network. Okay. The first thing we got is we call ranking, ranking and clustering working together. We get one algorithm which can do both, which can help each other. Okay. The philosophy actually is very simple. You think about it, suppose you get a bunch of authors you do not know, you get a bunch of conferences you do not know. Okay. But you list them based on where they publish. Can you easily find the clusters of the conference and cluster of authors? Say those authors actually working in the same field, those conference actors in the subfield, same subfield, but the author. Actually, it's not hard. You think about this. Just because even you do not know these two conferences by name, they look so different. Okay. But if they have constant, have many, the subset of co-authors or authors, they constantly contributing to the same venue. Okay. Those menus essentially are on the similar topics. Okay. Plus those authors, actually to some extent, are the similar you know, authors working in the same field. Okay. So, just based on this, you can easily work out clusters. But the interesting thing is, okay, how do you know which like, venue or which author will be ranked high in certain field? Okay. Actually, if you look at this connection, it's also not hard. The reason is you can easily work out some simple ranking rules. For example, you can say, who publishes more papers in certain field? 
who will be ranked high in that field. Actually, that's too simple a rule. We actually work out a, a little more complicated rules, saying you publish more papers in the highly regarded conferences, you'll be ranked high. Okay. But how do you know what conference is highly regarded? Actually, if you say those conferences can attract many highly regarded authors, will be highly regarded conferences. Okay. But this one is like a page bank. Okay, like a, you know, his algorithm, they mutually enhance each other. Okay. So we actually use this one work out the algorithm is clustering, ranking, working together in the same EM algorithm, same group. Okay. So the nice thing is with this, we actually can partition, you give a K, say K is 15. We partition the computer science into 15 fields. Every field, what are the major conferences, which conference rank high, which also rank high, which keyword rank high, actually become very nicely ordered and achieving, you know, amazingly high level. Okay. In a sense, actually people say, you know, your system knows nothing about English or computer science, but you can rank all these authors and keywords and conferences in a very, very nice level reaching the expert performance. Okay. That's a magic network. Actually, if you put this network a little training, training C, small number of uh, elements you labor them. For example, you can say this paper is about machine learning. This paper is about database. Okay. Actually, with the paper, they can propagate to conferences, to authors, and they can compete among those rivals. So with this clustering and ranking and clustering uh, classification and ranking working together, you make it a very high quality. Okay. Actually, you labor on this one, this one linked to the other type. So you're going to labor on paper. And immediate authors and venues and keywords will be labeled as well. Okay. So it's a, it's a very interesting. I, of course, you say, you may want to give me computer science, which some you know, examples. I'm going to give you something more exciting, pictures. And with this picture, one of my students actually took, took those pictures and just to give the picture <coughs> you know, links, syncing the picture, linking to you know, the, the texture, the, you know, the different colors, and the, those uh, you know, different uh, hue, linking with this. And he automatically clustered hundreds of thousands of pictures into different clusters. Okay. This is just uh, showing you for example, this one I can double shade hotel if you go closer. And those are the nine view of all the hotels. They automatically cluster together. Okay. Just because they, they share a lot of similarity. Okay. And more interesting is I got a one visitor who came, who, who is a professor in the University of Queensland in Australia. He came, he looked at our system, he said, that's magic. He went back. He says, I want to automatically cluster and ranking the disease and treatments to find out which disease, what are the most effective treatments. I said, how, how could you know that? He said, it's very simple. Okay. He went to PubMed, which is <coughs> medical publications. He got one assumption. He said, if this disease, if these treatments are effective, in the academic journals, they will discuss more thorough. You will see lots of terms linked together. Okay. He built a big network, and then put a bunch of those diseases, like AIDS, like you know, all the different things and journals and articles, authors, link them together in similar kinds. This is his prediction on the top 10 treatment for AIDS. <laughs> okay. And all the TBs, you know, like uh, hepatitis, uh, all these different diseases. He showed to the medical school professors who were very surprised because these like, top 10 treatments is almost ranked the same as the best medical scientist in the okay. So you probably can see this simple algorithm actually to some extent can work out magic. I just show you some computer science you probably can see. I don't know whether you know computer science terms, but this probably is very simple. This cluster actually is about the information retrieval web. Okay. What you can see is these are the top five ranked keywords. Retrieval information web search text. That one from a sub key. Okay. And I actually thought about it. I asked my neighbor who is a professor on information in favor. So give me better words than this top five. He actually said it's very hard for me to work out another one to compete this five keywords. Okay. That simply says 
the algorithm actually really works by common sense, but but blindly clustering and ranking those things. Okay. And even you can find the similar things. For example, uh, once you link things in the network in a heterogeneous way. For example, we link the Flickr with tag, user, group tag, and image. Link them together. Okay. Then we can easily grab one image, like a lotus flower. You see, which other image is most similar to this image in Flickr? Okay. The interesting thing is, if you don't find the right <coughs> map paths, because, for example, if you say image tag image, based on just based on that group of tags, you may not find the best you know, similarity. For example, this is lotus flower, these are the other kinds of flowers, this is the bird. Okay. Definitely they're not so similar. Flickr has so many images. But if you use not only tag, but also use group tag, link them together as this kind of meta path, you see those images are very, very similar. They are all lotus flowers. Even this one has nothing blossom, but it's still lotus flower. So you probably can see, you know, you can based on the map paths. <coughs> the interesting thing about map paths is we look at the authors. Okay. Of course, you bring a very famous author, no matter which algorithm you, you, you get, you probably find another famous author. They are very similar. Okay. But we, we bring one which is a young one. Okay. We bring one, An Hai Duan, who was in UIUC, but he was grabbed by University of Wisconsin, Madison. He joined Madison, Wisconsin in the year 2006 or so. Okay, so we say, who is most similar to him? Okay. The interesting thing is, if you use personalized page rank or many other things, they basically, those big, big name guys working in the same field, like uh, Philip e. Hacker, Gus, and Nina, or me, we got lots of papers. So say, oh, this on Python is most similar to them. But those people already published like 500 papers. Okay. So, the interesting thing is we use our algorithm, the path similarity, looking at the map paths. We find these several guys much more similar. Among these 500,000 authors, these are the top five or the top four most similar authors. Okay. The very interesting thing is I gave a talk in Ann Arbor. They were, uh, they were applaud, uh, applauding. Uh, why? They say, you know, Jignish Packer, which is most similar to him, actually was he was a professor, young assistant professor in the University of Michigan and Arbor, for almost similar years, but grabbed by Madison, Wisconsin. Grabbed down there. Okay. So who could be most similar to this guy? Because they work in the same field, got a PhD not so many years apart. But on the other hand, they were both really good and they grabbed by Wisconsin Madison. Okay. So that simply says among five hundred thousand authors, you can clearly distinguish based on their publications, their keywords. You know, their ranking, you know, many things you can, you can detect them. Okay. Uh, another interesting thing, that's what I just told you, say, how to predict the future co-authors. Okay. Uh, actually, people really think the future co-author is extremely hard to predict, which to some extent is not easy. Okay. But we actually did the test. We used a different metapass. Okay. So-called metapass is you have different ways to link to different parts. For example, uh, the A is author, P is paper, and if you get an error bar, it means this paper side the other paper. Okay. You based on A, P, side P, then go to A. That means if you cite this paper, whether you are going to co-author with this paper, in the, uh, this author in the future. There's possibility, right? But there could be more possibility. We actually use uh, the test. You probably see the p-value, very sharp p-value is actually worth the other ones. Like, uh, like this one says, uh, they work in the same venue. Okay, they publish things in the same venue. This one says they actually co-author with the same author. This one says they use similar terms. Those are actually some sharper. For example, if you use this one, this one is the most p-value. Okay, what does this mean? This one actually says, if you author a paper, this paper cite the other paper, that the other paper cite the other paper, uh, whether you are going to co-author <laughs> the other paper. It's more like this. Suppose, you know, uh, this guy said, I cite a paper, I, I'm a computer scientist, cite a paper of, say, uh, Mark Newman, who actually uh, working on networks, but it, it's a physicist, okay? 
And suppose Mark Newman cited uh, Arvin Einstein. Okay. Are you going to work in the next years or few, few years with Einstein? That's impossible, right? Once you get a citation leaked, you know, multiple chains, it's just too far. The, the semantic link is too weak. So we use this, this uh, one that we made based on the training. The interesting thing is I passed on my own student. Okay. I got a student finished in 2002. So we test from 2003 to 2009 what a new co-author is going to get. Of course, we know the real fact because we already passed 2009. Okay. So we mask all the other parts of data. We tried it. We get this five, top five. Okay. Then within the six years, this top five should be this new co-author. Okay. The interesting thing is we check the data. Four of them are true. The only thing was not true is Osman Zayan. It happens Osman Zayan was also my student. He's a professor in the University of Alberta. They were both in Canada. But they did not collaborate. Okay. So I put this one. That happens last year. He was the KDD uh, PC co-chair. He was sitting there. I gave keynote. And he raised his hand. He said, uh, of course, I said, probably they do not like each other because it's the same group. He raised hands and said, no, we like each other. We just did not get a chance because you said 2009. If you extend two more years, we did have a paper. <laughs> okay. So it's very interesting. So then the interesting story is with you know, this magic thing, you can get a structured data, link them together. But in many cases, data is not structured. There are lots of things you do not know, do not you know, make explicit in the real data. The first interesting thing to make explicit is about advice and advice e when we study <laughs> the publications. Okay. And who is whose advisor and advice e. okay. The interesting thing is once you link, because we assume advice and advice e during the time of, of advising, there were some joint publications. That's a general assumption. Okay. So we only can work on publication you know, database. And we have the year, and uh, we have the publication co collaborations. We build this graph. Okay. With this graph, we put some simple constraints. For example, we say advisor, advisee, you know, when the advisee, you know, working with the advisor, that starting time. The advisor usually have longer publication history and has more publications than advisee. Usually that's true. Okay. If you publish much more paper than your advisor at that time, you probably don't, don't want to you know, follow him. You want to follow some major, bigger names, right? So another one is that once advisee become an advisor, in the future will not become an advisee again. Okay? Uh, usually you've got a degree, you don't want to you know, apply another graduate school. Okay? But anyway, that, that may happen. Actually, in my department, there was one professor who retired. He became a student of law school. Okay? That, that happened, but very rare, okay? But not in computer science itself, right, at least. So, but anyway, we use this. We actually work out, uh, use small training <coughs> set. We work out something you probably can see. We test many data sets. The, the accuracy is pretty high. It's about 80 to 90%. The interesting thing is we put a few real people to do tests, okay? For example, we put uh, David Bly, who is a professor in Princeton. Okay, say who is his advisor? Actually, David Bly's advisor will recognize who. One is Michael Jordan. One is John Lafferty. Okay, uh, actually, it happens. These are the years we predict. The real case is actually Michael Jordan was his advisor, and he graduated in 2004. Okay, so th 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 this year was not that bad. Okay, yeah. Then for the for the other second advisor, the time is short. Actually, was his postdoc. At that time, uh, John Lafferty was in CMU, now he's in the University of Chicago in the statistics department. Okay. And this is my own student. The prediction is almost uh, very accurate. One is his master advisor. I was her PhD advisor. Okay. But uh, the interesting thing is we put Serge Brand, who was Google co-founder, who won't find his advisor. Uh, that's everybody interested in. But actually, we made a wrong wrong prediction. We predicted Rajiv Monwani, 97 to 98, was his advisor. Actually, the year was quite accurate because he's 
found, he got this page rank algorithm and set up Google in 1998, and he left Stanford. Okay. But the interesting thing is, my prediction was wrong. The reason was, actually, when I gave a talk in UCLA, Carlos Agnolo, you know, point out. Carlos will say, no. Rajiv's uh, search, yes? Based on co-authorship, predict who is his advisor. Because, like a search, he worked out several papers with quite many people. So you do not know who is his academic advisor. Okay. And which year. Okay. So uh, the interesting thing was actually, uh, you know, like uh, Carlo said, you know, you were wrong. Okay. Uh, because Hector Gossip Molina, who was the Stanford department head, he was his advisor. But uh, Hector was so so busy, okay, so he got no papers with him. Okay. So I made a correction. I said that it should not be Rajiv, but it should be Hector. Okay. But uh, to my own surprise, actually, uh, Jeff Arman, a uh, year ago, did the UIC. He already retired. We got a lunch together. We, I mentioned this. He said, you were all wrong. Okay. I was his advice. That's Jeff Arman. And he said, I even had a paper with him. Okay. And I checked, it's true. Okay. It's very true. But the interesting thing is that Rajiv got quite a few papers with Serge. And Jeff Arman, as the third author, had one paper with him. And the second author is Rajiv. Okay. That, that's the reason we made the wrong prediction. But it, overall, it's not that bad. Okay. But you know, there are many other things. I probably, the time is up. I probably should not uh, give you more. Uh, things. This is about the uh, truth finding. That means you get a lot of different things on the web, some are right, some are wrong. Whether you can have a nice algorithm to find which piece is true. Okay. So actually this is a pretty large text. We got uh, Microsoft Bing data. There's hundreds of thousands of authors and claims and uh, directors. But there are lots of noise. The, the claim is not right. Without any single piece of training data. We want to predict which <coughs> this hundred thousand claims, which piece of claim is right, which is wrong. Okay. The interesting thing is that we can get F value that high for movie directors without anything about each train. We know which piece is right, which piece is wrong. Okay. On the web. So it's very interesting. There are light, nice algorithms. The final one I want to show is we got lots of topics. Like in computer science, we got lots of topics. Can you automatically recognize what are the critical terms in which field? Okay, for example, in machine learning, okay, just to look at the data, we actually do not know which one is machine learning. We collect the data in the whole like the two million entries. Then we just say this cluster, you find that the top layer and second layer, the terms. Okay. This is the term. We actually take show to the people who get top 10 terms in machine learning. Many machine learning people say, you already got it. Okay, It's almost an expert can say that. But this one is top seven. Learning, support vector machine, reinforcement learning, feature selection, condition learning, feature, classification decision trees. So it's very interesting. You get this. And uh, the, you know how to find the phrases. Uh, actually, even for example, in, in tsunami, OK? Japan tsunami. Uh, you probably know if you go to Wiki, the tsunami will never link to its nuclear things. Okay. But here you probably can see nuclear plant meltdown actually tsunami is so closely. It's right underneath, which we also know it should be right, at least for Japan tsunami. Okay. So, yes. So I will finish. I just say the conclusion essentially is that we got lots of data, but the data. <coughs> With a structured network can lead to lots of intelligence. And we say the network, the link, actually type the link, disclose, disclose lots of information. Okay. The, the data mining can do a lot of things to dig those hidden information out. Okay. Uh, so we got quite a bunch of books on this. And the students, this is just a picture of several students with me. But these students already, you know, like the three of them already become uh, assistant professors at different universities now. And, you know, one is in Notre Dame, one is in Penn State, one is in Northeastern. Uh, they're very not, not teaching in Northeastern this year, uh, 2013. 
the KDD, the largest conference, every year give a single award to the best PhD dissertation. And she got the 2013 KDD dissertation award. The best thesis, you know, internationally. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions. Josh, Josh, with a microphone. Is there a second microphone? This should be good. Yes, yes. So, Javi? Yes. Check. Okay. So Javi, thank you yes. so much for this. This is um, stuff that many people in the social sciences ought to see, but don't have a chance normally to see it. And so I appreciate you sharing it also in such a non-technical and lucid fashion. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, I, I, the one question that I know you've thought about, and it's a question of debate amongst people who do interdisciplinary work across social and computer sciences, uh, is the extent to which the data mining results that give you such high levels of precision, accuracy, F ratio as you were showing us, um, how much do they help in prediction versus explanation? Uh, yeah. Because of in, in the social sciences, traditionally there has been this notion that our focus is to explain and understand why something is happening instead of just being able to, for example, predict the, the advisor. Yes. Um, there's been a lot of debate about this. You and others have convinced me that there needs to be some hybrid, but I'd love to get your thoughts about how, what, what do you see in, from a computer science perspective as a relationship between prediction versus explanation? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Actually, in data mining, there are two major paths you can think. One people call descriptive data mining, the other one called predictive data mining. Descriptive data mining essentially is description. That means you give me the facts, I can give you what are the things, why I lead to the same. Right? Give me a conclusion, I can give you the chains. Here, actually, you probably can see, we, give you a stat we can give you statistics on the chains. Okay? But with chain, with a regression, with you know, the classification, construction, there will be the power of prediction. Okay? But the key for prediction is you should get enough structural information to do quality for example, if you see, like we got to this prediction of the collaborators of my own students, you can see that this one, okay. uh, not to say advisor, but this one. Okay. You know, we have in computer science, you look at the authors, the total author in this database is 700,000, more than 700,000. To predict top five will be your co-authors in the next several years. It's not that easy, right, because there, there are so many candidates. But the, the thing is, you know, based on the past, you have, you already collected, for example, up to 2002, you already collected about 30 years data. Okay. Based on 30 years data, we work out these, this map paths. That means which relationships, that means which semantic relationships will play more role in the prediction. Essentially, is you work out these regressions, you know, different uh, statistic measures. You know, you can see we got this value. You actually will know which paths, which map paths. Essentially, it's rather complicated map paths. Which paths will have how much weight? Okay. Based on this, and you also know, like uh, Jan Fei, he already by 2003 he already published quite a bunch of papers. You got it's not like a branch like a fresh new student, I, I know nothing about him. I already know his you know, productivity and which field he's working on. So to that extent, if you start doing prediction, it's more reliable, because you have lots of data. So to, to a certain extent, what our philosophy is, massive, but a highly structured data, okay, give you the power of prediction. If you only use very smart data, it doesn't work. Actually, this one is we really use almost like two million entries to do the prediction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes? Jolly? Leslie's got a question. Yes. So first of all, thank yeah. you. This was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I'm you. in organizational psychology, and I'll echo what Nashir said, that we don't often get exposed to these kinds of findings. Um, so one kind of big picture question I have about this is a lot of these phenomenon are inherently 
relation, social relational phenomenon that are behind the reasons why people are doing, why the prediction works? Yes. Um, what do you see, is there any role for social science, tra more traditional social science, and what is that role? Okay. Uh, of course, I, uh, I, I'm pretty naive on social science, but uh, you know what I what we can say is this. Okay. What what we can say is this. This why is a literal exception. Okay. Why? Because the computer science publication is almost all the activities on the publication. You collect it, you publish it, so you almost grab all the things you need. But in the real social science, you won't get data say that's the that's the factor, and I collect all the factors. So the data in social science you get is is more like a scattered, subjective, noisy, or something. That's a part of computer science we have a hard time. Okay, you think about this. For computer science, why we grab this data, we can do it just because whatever you do for research publication in computer science, you put in this database. Okay. Almost all the things you've got is there, okay, and it's structured, and it's not noisy, okay, to a certain extent. I got how many publications I checked the database. I know they don't miss it, and they almost they don't miss messed up with other authors. Okay, but that's the very clean data. But that's somewhat easy, yeah. But the social science is actually facing more challenging tasks because the real world is not that complete, not. That you know, like uh, true, or you know, like uh, structure. I, I think that's exactly the computer scientists who work with social social scientists to learn a lot because of our knowledge on social science is just too minimal. Okay, but but that's also like in NSCTA, they actually promote us to work together with social scientists with uh, you know all the different kinds of people. We we think we we, we have learned quite a lot. Yeah, I have uh, actually two questions, and they're somewhat related. First, uh, you began by saying that there were uh, status issues that you could uh, work out. Did you use that in this to be able to predict co-authorship? Yes. Uh, and then the second question is uh, a lot of times with, for example, status, but there could be other issues, there's uh, intentional shunning. So how do you incorporate the negative side where somebody is trying to socially exclude somebody else? Okay. Yeah, that, that, that to some extent actually is a really tough task. The first question is actually those things, for well, all those like a meta pass, all these things, actually we use substantial statistics. That means the computer science, actually what we, why are we doing data mining? We can actually find the computer science education to some to some extent, it's not quite adequate. Okay. Because of the computer science in the past, the training is more on the data structures, computer algorithms, computational complexity, all these things. But actually, to analyze massive amount of data, the statistics actually play a very critical role. The interesting thing is, this, this, the student who work out these, actually her major, I intend to pick her up, her major is computer science and a statistic double major. Okay. And even she was doing her PhD, she actually got over half of the course in statistics. So you probably can see. That simply says, the computer science, the current status, to try to work on data mining problem, the background is not sufficient. Okay. And plus, you know, there are many social scientists, other scientists, we constantly working with them because you don't know the other field. You just cannot use the knowledge, you know, accumulating other fields to solve the real world problems. The so computer science is the one, one angle to solve the problem, but there are many other angles. So that's why I say the multidisciplinary research, to some extent, is really, really important. Thank you. Uh, Steve, please. Uh, I think it's good start a follow-up question uh, in this line of I mean, I, this is fascinating. I think Leslie's observation is there's there, there's a hidden structure in these data based on the relationships. This is how people work. This is how the fields operate. How, how do, where, what would be the kind of data that you would move to next um, that would allow you to uncover relationships that are 
like less obvious, where the, the artifacts aren't so clearly driven by our activity to be scientists, to be visible, and, and to publish and such. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve, that's a, actually it's a most challenging question to us as well. You probably can see, we moved away from highly structured data to the like a text data, like a news, like a data.gov, and all those kind of data. Twitters, because of those data actually give us more challenge, but also to some extent more exciting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sandy? Uh, so, so as someone who's done some of this similar sort of stuff, I think there's the connection to social science uh, comes in two ways. Uh, one, one good and one bad. So, uh, what you're doing is you're doing a prediction uh, and analysis. You can imagine um, that uh, you go to engineering. That could be actually engineer situations to cause certain sorts of co-authorship structures. And to do that, you'd have to have a generative model underneath this, something that, that actually uh, talks about how the effect sizes uh, compare and how they interact, which, which you can get. I mean, there's math to do it. It's not a trivial thing. But that would come very close to a social science model because now it's saying the individual actors act in this particular way. Uh, and so that would, if you emphasize the generative model, then that would be very directly comparable. The other thing, though, that strikes me, and I see that in my own work, too, is we do almost everything in this Western international cooperative uh, culture. So a lot of the effects we see are all one-sided. The people intend well. They, they have a, a very similar culture in some way. They may be from all over the world, but um, it's not like operating in Rwanda 10 years ago. It's like completely different. And, and I think that's a, another place where this sort of work has a hard time reaching into what are some of the key interests of social science, which are conflict and war and, and the, the sort of negative side of things. Because we just don't have data for that. Yeah, th these two excellent points. Actually, uh, I fully agree that generative model actually is very powerful. To a certain extent, definitely can link with uh, social scientists. Like this one, actually, we try to work out the structures. Actually, underneath, we try to work out the structures, actually, it's a generative model. In a sense, we assume there must be some mechanism to generate these typos. Okay. And this mechanism, we dig out uh, those, those, those keywords, and even those keywords, how to get this, get this real type generated, actually is underneath, so we are using the generating model. So, so to that extent, it would be very nicely tied with the social scientists. And for the negative facts, which is very true, actually there are many things we only store the positive <coughs> ones. Okay. But the negative one, if we can store the negative one, actually some prediction could be even better. So the problem is most of like uh, the real data, they only store what's inside, like what's a paper published. They, they do not store it's even what's paper rejected, right? <laughs> okay, uh, that's a William Bowler. Thank you, that was a, um, a wonderfully engaging talk. Uh, the question I wanted to ask about was um, topic modeling and sort of topic discovery in a way. One of the things that the data mining people taught me is that faculty in computer science, engineering, and linguistics are incredibly predictable. They are well behaved. That's precisely the uh, standards they're um, So let's assume that world, that part I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, um, and realize the limitations. But in that world, think of Brian's talk yesterday about the frontiers of convention, where he's talking about these things are conventional, but they're on the edge. How do you start thinking about topic distance and how far away things can be that they'll be recombined in the future? Yeah, actually, it's a, this is a very tough question, actually. Uh, the topic, we, for example, like getting this one, we use topic <coughs> model, but we do not completely use the classical topic model. Okay. The classical topic model is still thinking about, you give me a bunch of documents. You generate something, actually it's a single keyword, a bunch of single keywords. 
if you get a bunch of secret keywords, for example, like support vector machine, you pretty sure vector in any field there are lots of vectors. Machine probably has nothing to do with computer science. The machine probably more to mechanical and engineering part. But then here you probably see the support vector machine getting together, it becomes a very powerful thing for AI for machine learning. Okay. So that's actually the thing is you cannot just use the single unigram to generate this topic, so you, you, you will think your model will be smart enough. Okay. We actually use this more like a frequent pattern mining integrated with topic modeling. That means we first use topic model, generate the unigram, and based on unigram, we actually going back to the original data to do the, you know, it's more like a frequent pattern mining. We use, you know, a little tricky standard, finally we work out these keywords. Once you get these keywords, their link, their reading in the graph is also based on the statistics, you know, which one is more popular together. So finally, this distance, they are very subtle. Okay. But finally, we can work out the clusters based on this distance. Of course, all the clusters are soft clusters. For example, even support vector machine, not necessarily just use the machine learning. You, you may see in many other fields, they also have a hyper support web vector machine because they use it. Okay. But uh, you know, you once you see the major distribution, you will credit support vector machine machine learning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I just wanted first to comment on the last comment. We uh, I, I'll talk about it a bit about on in panel. We look also with these tools into our own discipline and it was very interesting to see how this discipline evolves in terms of topics and how the teams evolve to follow it up. So that would be at the panel. Uh, what I wanted to mention, it's close to our heart, how we can work with sociologists. And I am sort of uh, uh, a computer scientist with a strong bias towards sociology. And I wanted to mention that we as computer scientists, with my computer science head, what we do is behavioral social science. We don't know why people do things, but we observe what they do. And that's a very good starting point <coughs> for human experimentation. For example, if I would now put my sociologist hat, I would organize the workshop of unwritten papers and invite people who are supposed to have papers together and don't yet have, and then observe what happens. Maybe a great science would come out of it because these people are destined to work together. They have maybe views which would be very, very complementary, and organizing such a workshop may get results, and it's easy to do it. So sociologists, grab it. That's opportunity for you. Organize the workshop on the papers and see how many of them would be written. That would be a very good exercise in looking how we can move from global to local. But I also would like to say a warning, which is very, very important in predictions. So in other words, all the predictions represent all the knowledge which we have. And as a student of history, I love this example of one of the smartest leaders in the history of the world, which was, uh, you know, leading Pericles. He was leading the Athens at the time of travels with Sparta in ancient Greece. Extremely capable, he invented wonderful time how to conquer, how to win with the Sparta fight for the dominance of the Mediterranean Sea. He built a huge wall between Port and Athens because Athens had unconquered, uh, unconquered maritime services which provided food. And then, where Spartans were devastating the lands around the Athens before the results. Plan worked wonderfully, except that in the second year, mass of people within the walls created perfect conditions for, for disease. And then, Terrible disease came, his two sons died first, and he died himself. 30% of the Athens population were wiped out. So this perfect plan didn't take into account something which was not known at the time, that epidemics love close, you know, number of people, a lot of food, because food attracts the vectors, uh, rats, and as the result, that would, be, that would be the epidemics. So all predictions are limited. The other point, maybe more positive, is that really society move forward about, about what we call in computer science outliers. Guys who do not fit patterns. 
they break the rules and they change the world. So I think it is something which, again, sociologists can point out, that the world is changed not by what is observed or what is typical, but what is atypical. So that, with this, I would like to... Thank you, Bala. That That's was great. very interesting. I particularly like your idea of inviting people together. I'm not sure if it would lead to new papers or like a very crazy Agatha Christie novel. <laughs> <laughs> John Wayne, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.